Hello, folks. Welcome to the Ninja Ninja 2 podcast number 10. I'm your host, Don Rowley. Uh, this is the episode we'll, that most likely will get me death threats. You have been warned. Mm-hmm. Today, we are going to talk about Yasuke, the so-called African samurai. It's kind of been big in the news, and the authentic history kind of been hijacked of those with a racial agenda, unfortunately. I'm going to be dealing with that um, and talking about that, but we... Uh, but it does cloud the issue, and I'm going to deal with some actual facts we know of from records of the time of Yasuke's life, as well as background that is frequently uh, misinterpreted and distorted, uh, sometimes on purpose. Okay, so again, Yasuke was a guy uh, that went to Japan, brought there by the Europeans, um, and he ended up in Oda Nobunaga's service as a sword bearer. Okay, and a lot of people have been talking about how he was the first non-Japanese samurai, or at least a black samurai. And there's a lot of problems with this. Um, first of all, and most important, nobody in the 16th century called him samurai. There's not a reference in any language, Japanese, Spanish, or Portuguese, calling him a samurai. There is a reference by uh, Akechi Mitsuhide, who was a general of Nobunaga, calling him a black slave, but nothing calling him a samurai, which is rather unusual considering that, you know, he um, he would have, when William Adams, the guy that the character Blackthorn from Shogun was roughly, you know, based on, um, when he made samurai, he was like, oh, wow, okay, samurai, samurai, wow, he made samurai. I mean, people were astounded and people wrote about it. So there are references of William Adams being called samurai. There is nothing like that for Yasuke. Okay, uh, so that is that. Um, in addition, there is a reference to him being given a short sword. Okay, so he was given a short sword. The uh, thing is, short swords could be carried by commoners, could be carried by peasants, but a short sword combined with a long sword was the exclusive preview of the samurai class. If you were not of the samurai class, you could not carry a short sword and a long sword at the same time. End of story. They did bother to, to list the weapons that uh, Yasuke was given. And as I said, it was a short sword. There is no mention at all in any historical records of him being given or carrying his own long sword. A lot of people think that um, because he was a sword page, this means that he was a samurai, that he followed his master into battle and protected him on the battlefield. Lots of problems with that. First of all, let's look at the, uh, the, the sword page or the sword bearer, you could call it. This was a job normally given to children, okay? Um, it was not given typically to seasoned warriors. Seasoned warriors became guards or something like that, not sword pages. They were not really battlefield uh, material. Um, they were not used on the battlefield. The simple reason is that if you're going into battle, you keep your sword on you, Um if you look at some of the illustrations of the time of lords, you know, different warlords on the battlefield, they have their sword on them. The reason is kind of simple. Um, it's so easy to get separated for someone. And, you know, you don't want to have your sword go someplace else when you're in the middle of an ambush. Imagine the situation. You're not even on the front lines. You're going down the ways and all of a sudden, bang, 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 there's some musket shots and the sword bearer goes down, and the next thing you know, you're you're face to face with a whole bunch of guys with swords trying to kill you. And you know, the sword carrier's got your sword. That's not a good thing. Um, and these types of ambushes did happen. Uh, there was a, a warlord named Takeda Shigen, who was once attacked when he was in his camp on a hill overlooking the battle, so suddenly that he had to use the war uh, fan made of wood in his hand to parry the blows until his guards could basically come in and you know, drive them off. So yeah, so if you were close to a battlefield, you carried your own weapon. The sword bearer was basically a child that, you know, back at the castle or the court, maybe, you know, uh, the, the camp where they're discussing strategy for the battle the next day or something like that, you know, not the most um, dangerous situations, but, you know, situations where like, oh, it's a bother to carry around the sword. Have some kid carrying it around. So yeah, so that's that's it. Um, kids normally had you know the job of sword bear for a lot of things. One of the darker reasons was that uh, homosexuality was accepted in 
Japan, and of course, many homosexual men throughout the ages go for small children. You can still find it in like the badlands of Afghanistan and Pakistan, you know, them keeping around a young boy to have sex with. Um, in fact, one of the few cases I know of an adult uh, filling the role of a sword bearer was a guy named Mori Ranmaru, who worked for Oda Nobunaga. Yes, Oda Nobunaga was known for having sex with a sword page. Um, now, did he, did that happen with Yasuke? History doesn't say anything. Um, but doesn't, you know, there has been speculation. Um, some have even speculated that Yasuke didn't have a choice, that Oda wanted to try something new. Um, and so they, so Yasuke was basically held down. Uh, that's silly, I think. I mean, you do not do that. You do not violate someone like that. Then have him sit right next to you with a sword. I mean, really. So, yeah. So if there was any sex um, between Yasuke and Oda Nobunaga, it was consensual, almost definitely. Um, again, there's no reference to him being having a, you know, being a sex partner. But, you know, that's something that they're probably a little bit demure about. You know, they're, if you made samurai, that would be something that you would expect them to write about. Often they would not talk about what goes on in the bedroom if anyone else even knew. The most we can say is that uh, Yasuke worked for a man who was known to have sex with his sword bearers. That's it. Um, now, I'm going to cut things off right now. Anyone wants to make fun of Yasuke for being a homosexual, possibly, cut it out. Join the 21st century, okay? There is no shame in being a homosexual. I'm not a homosexual, but then again, you know, I don't eat a lot of things, and I don't make fun of people because they don't eat, you know, because they do eat it. That's my opinion. Um, on the other side of the coin, there's going to be a lot of people that are going like, how dare you suggest that Yasuke? It's like... What? Is it is being a homosexual supposed to be a shameful thing? Is this a bad thing? Um, am I, you know, am I saying that he did something bad? If the sex was consensual, you know, just 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 leave the homophobic comments to yourself and get over it, okay? We don't know if he was a homosexual or not. Uh, it is a possibility, but if he was, big freaking deal. Do not put any homophobic comments in the comment section. I will not tolerate that type of thing from anybody. Okay? Now, um, yeah. So there's also some, certain problems with the whole idea. I mean, the idea of going into combat with Oda Nobunaga. Uh, you got to understand, Yasuke and Nobunaga met in 1581. Oda was killed in 1582, not too long. But by 1581, when he met Yasuke, he had stopped becoming a battlefield commander. He was the strategic commander. He sent out his generals like Tokugawa and Toyotomi to, you know, pursue campaigns on his behalf. While he stayed mainly around the Kyoto area and Owari area, which is not too far away, the center of political power. This was where the imperial court was. Um... They always had their schemes going on, and they had to keep an eye on them so that they didn't, like, encourage someone to rebel against him and report, uh, restore imperial order. He also had the shogun living in, the last Ashikaga shogun living in Kyoto until he tried to betray him by, to the Mori, and he kicked him out. So Nobunaga, by the time Yasuke came around, wasn't on the front lines. Uh, he was safely, you know, he was... Dozens and dozens of leagues away from where the battles actually were going on. Um, the most likely explanation for why he chose Yasuke is not that he was a warrior, but because he was so unique. Okay, If you live in Japan, you get used to the idea of just being like an object. Uh, one of my... One of the people that I worked with when I my first job in Japan as an assistant English teacher made a crack that, you know, they should just put us in a room and then every so often just come in with the visitors to City Hall and say, hey, look, these are our gaijin, and then walk on. It's, it's a thing even now. But again, back then, there was even fewer foreigners, and there was virtually no one with dark skin like Yasuke. So sitting next to Nobunaga there was just a way of Nobunaga showing off and eye candy. And that's it, okay? 
That is the most likely explanation. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's a few things uh, to go on. Um, some people have claimed that not only was he fluent in Japanese, but he was fluent in like a dozen languages. The historical record just show me show me the historical record. Show me someone from that era saying that he was fluent. Why nobody ever mentioned him being fluent in Japanese? Uh, undoubtedly, he could follow simple orders, you know, follow me, stuff like that. But fluency, um, let's just put it back then. Fluency in Japanese was a damn superpower. Um, it would have been remarked on, and also. People that were fluent in Japanese were extremely valuable. Francis Xavier has famously said that he believed that the Japanese language was created by the devil in order to prevent the Japanese people from hearing the word of God. Anyone that was fluent in Japanese was in extreme demand, and it's rather inconceivable to me that they would you know, send somebody that valuable off to do a job that basically be done by a kid. Furthermore, Oda Nobunaga was a paranoid in a day age of paranoia being a survival trait. Uh, there's a story attributed to Oda Nobunaga uh, of an encounter with his uh, bride. You know, he had a political marriage to you know, like secure his border, and one day, not too long after the wedding, I guess, she came comes in, finds him reading a letter. She asks what's going on. She says, "Oh, I'm, I'm, re I'm, I'm in communication with." And it gives the name of a general under her brother. That and he says that they're planning on disposing her brother and putting the general in charge of the the province, so that you know he's he's even better off, you know, a more secure border. Under the way things were supposed to be done, the wife's loyalty was supposed to transfer to Oda Nobunaga first, her brother second. But blood is blood. And not too long after this conversation, uh, somehow this general that was a key to everything, it's like the guy that you rely on for everything, gets taken out and, okay? This is what the type of person that Oda Nobunaga was. Um, so he distrusted everyone, everyone. And, you know, he, he, he liked the Jesuits because of trade and the technology, and they gave him little bits of knowledge about, like, how, do you, how they use weapons. Uh, pikes and such, but he didn't trust him. And to put someone like Yasuke, if he spoke fluent Japanese, right there at a you know uh, you know meeting of the council of elders or something like that, he, what assurance did he have that it wouldn't go straight back to the Jesuits? That oh, and Yasuke would not you know uh, report on him. I, of course, some people will say, well, well, you know, because they were so close. Well, he, were they really that close? I mean, they 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 were you know, sat next to each other, but really, you know, his own bride, the person that he slept with, betrayed him and passed along information, okay? So, fluency was probably not the case. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions um, and such like that. Um, one of the things that, you know, you're going to run across when talking about this is this book, African Samurai by Lockley and Gerard. And I'm just going to tell you right now, um, this book is fiction. It's academically speaking, it's doo doo. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's it. Um, and I'll tell you why. Again, it's related to the ninja. And I know my stuff when I'm talking about ninja. But in this book, in chapter five, they casually mentioned that they heard a story about a warlord by the name of Uesega Kenshin being killed by a midget ninja in the toilet with a spear, just like waiting for him to sit and then boom, so that there was like no uh, wound to be seen that, and just blood coming out of the anus. And in the bibliography, the, the further readings, you know, uh, the, he lists two books by Stephen Turnbell. Stephen Turnbell is a very qualified academic. His works are very, very reliable. He lists these two books, Ninja, AD 1460 to 1650. And this, Ninja Unmasking the Myth. Obviously, I have both books. I've read both books. And I can tell you, for a fact, that story about the guy in the commode does not appear in either of these books. As a matter of fact, if he had read Turnbull's 
first book on the ninja, Ninja, the True Story of Japan's Secret Warrior Cult, he would find that at page 54 to 58, Turnbull destroys the idea that there was a homicidal little person in the commode. Um, basically, Kenshin had stomach cancer. He showed signs that we can look at now, like collapsing and the, the lumps and stuff like that. Yeah, and, and so he did collapse in the toilet, and he did have blood coming out of the anus, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a ninja that did it. And so what these guys that wrote this piece of trash did was they came up with a story that they heard and they, you know, then assigned books that they knew was on the ninja and hoped that, hoped that people would not actually read it. Kind of like what high school students do with their teachers, you know. Um, this whole story about the the little person in the commode with a spear actually goes back to a book by Don F. Drager called Ninjitsu. Um, and it was one of the first books out in English. Uh, I actually had it. I was, you know, I used to play Dungeons and Dragons back in the day, um, back in middle school. Uh, the first set that I got came in a box with dice. And there's a magazine called Dr The Dragon Magazine. And one of the articles I read in Dragon Magazine was about the ninja. And for a middle school student, that was cool. And I bought every book I can find. And until Stephen Hayes came back from Japan around 1980, there's only two books, one by Andrew Adams and the book by John F. Dreger. So when the explosion of the interest, uh, you know, the ninja boom happened, a lot of the stories in those two books were recycled because there wasn't a lot of information. There was no internet, kind of limited information. So this story about the guy in the commode, you know, in the toilet, just got recycled and recycled. But as it turns out later on, it it proved that Don Drager, you know, despite being a very respected uh, authority on martial arts and Japan's, you know, um, military history, was asked to write this book. So he used stories from Japanese comic books, one of them being the toilet story. Another one, to give you an example, that was in his book was one ninja snuck into the bedroom of a rival ninja and then released weasels to kill off the this guy. Um, didn't use a blow or anything like that. Um, but he was countered because the target just kept a bag of rat dung by his bed. And weasels love rat dung. So he threw the rat dung on the guy that was attacking him. Weasels turned and killed the uh, the, the attacking ninja instead. Which, yeah, uh, you can see that, yeah, that's a good comic book story. But realistically speaking, no. So this whole story about the, the, the ninja in the, in the toilet with the spear, same thing. But yeah, so these guys that wrote this piece of trash did that sort of, does that sort of thing. Academically, that is unforgivable. Okay. You, you do not pretend to use sources that you, that you did not even read, you know, because again, those, that story does not appear in the books they say it does. Okay. Um, another thing that I caught them on a lie involving the ninja is that they have Oda Nobunaga inspecting Iga after the Battle of Iga Noran. And at, you know, some point, all these ninjas rise up from the ground, you know, and ambush him. And he and Yasuke are fighting for their lives. Um, I can tell you straight out, never happened, okay? There is nothing in any Japanese source that says this sort of thing happened. Uh, the closest that happened was that somebody once took a shot at Oda Nobunaga while he was riding around. That's about it. But they made this story up. Now, some of the things that they did in this story, I mean, like the background, they, they go into a lot of detail about how the Catholics worked in Japan and the intricacies of trade, which is pretty well, you know, in line with what I know, you know, and, and, and that stuff's readily available. You know, you can read tons of stuff about that. Um, some of the stuff that they said, you know, like, well, you know, we, we really don't know what happened to, you know, what Yasuke did before he came to Japan. But this is a battle that might have happened, and this is how it could have gone on with Yasuke, which can be forgivable. But to make but this story about going to Iga and being attacked by ninja, they present it as fact, and it is not. Okay, so this book is worthless. Okay, and and they're really trying to um, you know tilt things, you know, to make it sound like he was more than he probably was. One of the things being that, okay, um, so after Oda Nobunaga was die, died, Yasuke was known to have gone to Oda's son, Nobutada. 
They're the, the forces that betrayed Oda, ran him down. Um, it's known that Nobutada died there. He died fighting. The reference is, as it is written down, says that Yasuke was told to drop his sword and surrender. And he dropped his sword and surrendered. Um, now, these guys tried to make it sound like he was told to drop his sword. He instead fought. He got so wounded, taking on all these guys, that he lost so much blood that he the sword dropped from his hand, thus dropping the sword, and then he collapsed. And then they took him back to the, to the Jesuits. No one mentions that in any historical record. And if you think about it, before ERs, before trauma kits, before blood transfusions, that that would have just been a death sentence right there. He would have died on the spot. He would have bled, you know, after he collapsed, he would have bled out. They had no real, real reason to really save him uh, if in that case. And really, um, you know, it, it, if they if he did put up a fight, it's far more likely that he would have died like Nobutada did. They just stand back with muskets and just fill him full of holes. Yeah, um, so they try to do that. You know, they, they try to blend it. But um, again, no historical record is highly unlikely. Um, now, one thing that's also has been thrown out that I don't think these guys really covered that too much, but there was these, the story of Oda Nobunaga's death mask. And I was in Japan when this first broke. And it, it ran in the Japan Times, uh, English version, about how this family said that they had found that, that, that through they had a death mask of you know Oda Nobunaga passed down through their family to generations and generations, and the reason why they had it is that after Oda Nobunaga committed suicide, Yasuke took his head to Nobutada and somehow it got to one of the retainers, which was their family ancestor, and they made a death mask out of that. Now, on the Japanese side of things, there's like talk shows and stuff about history. Let's talk history and stuff. Immediately, everyone's going like, what the hell? It just doesn't make any sense. And for one thing, the Japanese did not do death masks. That was a European thing. So why would a Japanese make a death mask of Oda Nobunaga? And there was immediately a, um, a, a, a call to this family. Okay, let's take this to a lab, get it dated, you know, authenticate it, you know, and we'll see what you know happens. And the family did not respond. The family started pretending like it never happened. And the whole thing was quietly dropped. Um, so right now, if you get it, you know, uh, uh, like a book in Japanese about the life and times of Oda Nobunaga, they will not mention the death mask or any story related to Yasuke about that. And it's just, you know, of course, one of the things that really make that story so unbelievable is that the circumstances. Basically, Akechi Mitsuhide betrayed Oda Nobunaga. Nobunaga was staying at a temple in Kyoto. Akechi basically told us, you know, troops, the real enemy is at Honoji, and they marched there, killing everyone that on their way so that word can get back. They had complete surprise. They immediately surrounded the, the building that they knew Nobunaga was in, and they started peppering the thing with musket balls and throwing torches in. Oda Nobunaga was a classically trained samurai. He could use a bow and arrow, and he did not go down easily. There are stories well documented. You know, again, there's hundreds of witnesses surrounding this this building that he came out and he was like you know, killing people with his bow and arrow until the the flames were so you know large that it, there was you know again it was going to be a case of burning to death or killing himself. So he went back inside and killing himself. And, you know, that's it. Somehow, the head got from there to Nobutada. I mean, think about it. I mean, not only, you know, did somehow Yasuke get through these hundreds of people, fighting his way through them and surviving, but nobody mentioned this. There's hundreds of people that witness Oda Nobunaga fighting people with his bow and arrow at the end, and then going back inside to commit suicide. Nobody at the time said anything about Yasuke coming out. Um, also, you know, if if Yasuke came back after it was burnt down and found the, you know, the head, it, it wouldn't have been recognizable. They couldn't have made a, a mask out of it. So the um, 
most likely, you know, scenario is that Yasuke being a low-ranking servant was staying at, at the outskirts with the other servants. And Akechi's forces were so intent on surrounding Oda to barbecue him that they were able to get away while they were concentrating on that. And then he got to Nobunada when, you know, Akechi's forces caught up with them at there. They screamed, you know, drop the sword. And Yasuke, being pretty smart, figured, this ain't my fight, and just threw it down. At that point, he got taken to uh, Akechi. Akechi basically compared him to a dog. Um, you know, I mean, how much sin does a dog have for the criminal acts of his master? You know, all, all Yasuke was to Oda was a dog. Uh, nothing more. He did not help plan things. He did not, pers- you know, uh, personally do anything that would harm Akechi or anything like that. He was not even a pawn on the on the playing board. So he sent him back to the Jesuits. And at that part, at that point, we, you know, we lose sight in the historical records of what Yasuke is. So, yeah, so most likely he was a, you know, bystander and observer with a lot of really interesting history, but his influence, his, you know, uh, power was practically none. Unfortunately, there are some people that, you know, famously known as we was kings types or Wakanda forever types that somehow think that, you know, they can use this to promote their race as being a great thing. The whole thing kind of makes me think of a chicken screaming, my ancestors were Tyrannosaurus Rexes. Uh, you know, again, you know, if you have to take pride in what your ancestors were instead of what you do, pretty pathetic in my opinion. You know, I don't care if you're talking about Vikings or whatever. But these types of people, I mean, they're, they're saying that uh, things like, they point to a statue, a silver statue of the Buddha that is tarnished and saying, look, it's black. The, the historical Buddha was from Africa. Things like that, okay? And they really are pushing the idea that Yasuke was fluent in multiple languages and the real architect behind Oda Nobunaga's successes, stuff like that. And they're not too mentally stable sometimes. Um, again, I fully expect to get death threats. But just to give you an example of somebody that claims to be researching Yasuke, um, no Japanese ability, I can confirm that, um, and makes other wild claims, won't show us sources, etc. But let me just read this, what he said. Some of these folks are ignorant. I understand that. But since we have fully been to Japan, really? Don't see any pictures. Spoken with Japanese historian, we have actually been to Kyoto. The Yasuke learned South Africa is not obligated to listen to anything the Western Saltine and Graham family has to say. Oh my God, can you be more racist? Of course, some would turn around and say that you can't be racist towards whites. Anyways, these people are not too mentally stable. Um, and really, the reason why I'm doing this is that aside from one guy I know, uh, Professor Gaynor, I am a lot harder to kill than most academics. Uh, and really, there's a need to make history history. History is neither good nor bad. Um, and if you take pride and only pride in what you do, you are an idiot. Uh, in what your country did, you are an idiot. America can point to things like the moon landing, the liberation of Europe, the contributions of people like George Washington Carver, but we also have Manzanar, Jim Crow, Wounded Knee. History is not fan fiction. And really, if you look at history, anytime some movement tries to rewrite or portray history to make themselves look good, it doesn't end well. It looks especially bad every time that someone has said, we were these super things, we were above everything else, until these lesser being came along and took it away from us. Every time in history something like that has happened, the people they blame for bringing themselves down are targeted. Sometimes ovens, sometimes just programs. Um, history is history. And history should be correct. 
And I'm sure that there are going to be a lot of accusations. There's going to be a lot of uh, things said about me. But I want to deal with the facts. Now, if you have an opinion, state as an opinion in the comments section. If you have a question, go ahead. If there's something that you want to say, fine. But it, bring me facts, okay? I will change my mind if I'm presented with facts and I'm allowed to examine it. Uh, none of this, I have evidence, but I can't show you. But yeah, let's start a conversation if you want. Um, if you have questions furthermore on what Yasuke was, I'll try to answer them as best I can if I you know, know. But yeah, so that's it. And um, take care. Don't say that, you know, come back and watch the comment section because I think they're going to be, it's going to be very spicy. Good day and good night.